Viewers often ask me how long it took me to become fluent in Spanish. Um, I'd say that my answer really depends on how you define fluency. You know, I've seen these YouTubers claim that they became fluent in a language in like 30 days or so. And then they show themselves going to a local market and amazing the vendors by asking how much the mangoes are in their native tongue. Um, that's not fluency to me. I define fluency as the ability to carry on extended conversations with native speakers in real time. You know, your accent is understandable. You're able to create complex, grammatically correct sentences, you know, and spit these things out. In real time, you're not delaying going, yo, quiero, none of that. And you're able to understand at least the majority of what the other person is saying. And if you don't understand, you're able to clarify what that thing is and continue the conversation. That's fluency to me. And I would also like to add that at least in my case, fluency was the point when my translations could stand up in a court of law. Because you see, I needed Spanish for work. I was a deputy sheriff and that was the most important thing for me. Using that standard, I would say that I became fluent in Spanish in less than two years, probably about a year and a half or so. If you're just starting to learn Spanish and you're really eager to become fluent, that may sound like a long time. If you've been studying Spanish for a while and you're struggling to reach that level of fluency, that might sound like a very short time. If you're in that second group, you might want to stick around for the rest of the video because I'm going to share some tips and techniques that allowed me to become fluent faster. One word of warning though, this is going to be a long detailed video. Um, sorry about that. I don't like videos like that. It just needs to be so you truly understand, you know, what these techniques are, um, why I developed them, how they work, and you can see what kind of works in with your Spanish. It surprises a lot of people to learn that I almost failed high school Spanish. No matter how hard I tried, I sucked at it. And I barely squeaked by with a D and that's only because I had a lot of extra credit. I think I got points for my name or something. Anyway, um, fast forward a few years and I became a deputy sheriff in a rural county in Florida. At the time, the county was the leading producer of citrus fruit in the state. And they might still be, I don't really know. I don't keep up with that now. The agricultural industry in that county and the surrounding counties attracted tens of thousands of migrant farm workers, most of whom were from Mexico. Usually when I say, oh, I learned Spanish in Florida, everybody's like, oh, Cuban Spanish? No. Puerto Rican Spanish? No. Mexican Spanish. Hmm. Interesting. In my area, it was probably like 95% Mexican and the majority did not speak any English. So I set out to learn the language. This was in the early 90s. So that meant going to a bookstore or a library. Um, I chose the former. Uh, I bought a basic Spanish book and I would study it in my patrol car. I really found it super, super frustrating because it was laid out exactly like those classes were um, in high school Spanish and those didn't make much sense to me. Nevertheless, I kept at it. I learned some basics, including, um, you know, the conjugations for the present tense and the preterite. That's the simple past. That's important in law enforcement because we talk about things that have already occurred a lot. In practicing my Spanish with native speakers, I quickly discovered two things. Number one, it's a bad idea to buy a Spanish book with a picture of Spain on the back cover if your goal is to speak to Mexicans. That's where I learned there are significant differences in vocabulary and everything. And I still give that advice. Pick a country you like their Spanish and focus on their Spanish. It'll just make life easier. The second thing I discovered is something that turned out to be a huge deal and something that later, I mean, propelled my Spanish. And that is, I discovered that the present tense that I was seeing in my book was not the only present tense. I'll explain. When I started conversing with people in Spanish, I noticed that they were often, but not always, using different endings for verbs in the present tense. You know, I would think it would be quiere ending, you know, with an E, and they would say quiera with an A. And sometimes I would expect them to say ba, just like B-A, and instead they would say vaya. I would hear other words like aga, venga, and things I wasn't seeing in my Spanish book. This was happening every day. So I flipped all the way through my Spanish book, back and forth, looking for these things, and there was nothing there. So I went back to the bookstore and I started looking through other Spanish books on the shelf, flipping through them, and I still didn't find anything like what I was hearing. So I was figuring, okay, maybe this is just a Mexican thing, you know? And uh, then I picked up a book on advanced Spanish grammar that was there and started to flip through it and boom, there were the words. Vaya, aga, venga, everything was in there. There was an entirely different set of conjugations and this thing was called the subjunctive mood. 
Yes, it said mood and not tense. That's when I discovered that the present tense that I had learned up till that point was actually another mood called the indicative. I thought, you know what? I'm never gonna be able to, to learn this language, but I, I have to keep trying. Even if I could learn some, it's, it's gonna help me, right? So I kept at it. So now I'm aware of this whole indicative subjunctive thing. And as I continue to talk to people, it becomes pretty clear from listening to them that you have to know both of these if you ever want to learn to speak Spanish correctly. They are absolutely intertwined just like this all through the language. And then I was asking myself, why didn't they tell me this in school? And then I thought, maybe they did teach me this in school. I mean, I got a D. I wasn't learning anything anyway. So eh, maybe they did, but I still don't think they did. So that brings me to my first tip to help you become fluent in Spanish, and that is to stop avoiding the subjunctive. You will never speak Spanish well without it, ever. You just can't do it. So embrace it. Learn how to conjugate into the subjunctive and then learn when to use it. That last part's the tricky part, knowing when to use the subjunctive instead of the indicative. But don't worry, I have a tip in this video that's going to help you with that too. Remember that advanced Spanish grammar book I mentioned? Well, I ended up buying it and I'm glad I did because as I looked through it, and I was very resistant to grammar, you know, when I was in school, I hated the terms and things. But as I started to read through the book, I realized that grammar is a blueprint for the language. I could look in the book, read a rule, and then make sentences using deductive reasoning. These were sentences I may never have heard or even seen before but they were grammatically correct Spanish sentences. Finally, embracing the grammatical rules was really one of the big um, keys to helping me reach fluency. And on that note, you know, I've never understood these people on YouTube who say, you shouldn't learn the Spanish grammar. It's a huge waste of time. Those people, you know, just listen to people, converse with them in their native language and acquire it that way like we do as babies. Look, that's gotta be the, the dumbest advice I've ever heard in my life. Um, that approach where you're just going to, you know, immerse yourself in a language and learn it that way, I mean, it'll work, but it's going to take thousands and thousands of hours of exposure. Well, at least to speak it beyond just basic greetings and I'm from the United States, you know, really speak it. That's a lot of time. So how is that easier than spending 15 minutes to learn a grammatical construction and then dropping in different words to create phrases and sentences? I mean, you already know a language. You already speak English. Why aren't you capitalizing on that to, you know, create sentences in Spanish? It just doesn't make any sense at all why people would try to choose that other route, but eh, whatever. By this point in my Spanish learning experience, I'm communicating better with people. I mean, it's only been a couple of months of studying but I am nowhere near fluent. I couldn't translate fast enough in my head to be able to have detailed conversations with people. I was still struggling to understand what they were saying to me also. Um, at that point, I was listening for keywords and trying to get the meaning out of context, but I was not where I needed to be. That's when I started to work in some techniques to increase my vocabulary in Spanish and without having to memorize as many words individually, you know, to take advantage of similarities in the two languages. And I started to focus on how to um, speak more quickly and translate in my head faster. So I'm gonna share some of these techniques with you and maybe they'll help you too, all right? Let's talk about vocabulary first. It can be very frustrating just learning long word lists. I'm not saying you don't have to do that, you need to learn words, but you don't have to learn every word. Uh, I started focusing on cognates. Cognates are words that are in two different languages, but they share common linguistic roots. They often look very similar. Um, you can convert a lot of your English into Spanish using a lot of these cognate tricks. By far, the most useful cognate trick is the T-I-O-N, C-I-O-N cognate trick. And I use the word trick because it's almost magical, you'll see. The majority of words that end in T-I-O-N in English can be converted into Spanish by changing the last T to C and putting an accent over the O. Confrontation becomes confrontación. The key is then to pronounce the vowels correctly. Citation, citación. Justification, justificación. You can see where this could be useful, but that's not the best part, you know, that's just creating a lot of nouns for you. You can make verbs out of these things just by dropping that ending and adding an R. They become AR verbs. Just using the T-I-O-N trick, I'm getting over a 300 word vocabulary when you count nouns and verbs, and I haven't had to memorize any words. So that's a big one for you. I have videos on this channel to show you how to do that, 
and you know some of the ones that it doesn't work for and how some spelling changes work and little details. Um, you can watch that one later. That helped boost my vocabulary, but it didn't help me speak faster. So let's talk about techniques to do that. Um, one of the big techniques I use is I started relying on three sentence starters, actually three verbs um, that were already conjugated. And then all I had to do was drop in other unconjugated verbs like confrontar, to confront. That's not conjugated. I could just drop it in and make set phrases or sentences quickly in my head without conjugating. I already knew the first verb was conjugated. I didn't have to think about it. It made it really fast. So what three verbs are these? Well, I'll go through them. The first one is poder, to be able to. Now that's not conjugated. That's just to be able to. This is super, super useful. This is where I can say what people can do and can't do. This is when I can give people options. You can do this, you can do that. This is when I can ask for permission. Can I search your car? Can I speak to you? Super useful way to start anything. Now the key to using this correctly is to already have poder conjugated in your head so you're just popping in verbs. You say it all the time. There's a lot of different conjugations, third person singular, third person plural. But you know what I discovered pretty quickly? There's two people in every conversation I was in. Me, meaning I, and you, the other person. There are two yous in Spanish. There's the informal tú and the formal usted. I found right away that the tú form was much, much easier to use. I've got about five reasons for that, and I will talk about them in another video. I don't want to tie this one up. But I just started using those all the time. When it was I can, puedo. When you can, puedes. So I already had that in my head. Puedo, drop in a verb. I could ask somebody, ¿Puedo hablar contigo? Can I talk with you? Or I could give people options. Puedes ir al hospital. You can go to the hospital. O, puedes quedarte aquí. Or you can stay here. I could ask people, ¿Puedo estacionar el carro aquí? Can I park the car here? You can just see, I can talk about, well, just about everything. But I'm not having to think of puedo, I can, or puedes, you can. They're already in there. It's like a set formula and I'm dropping in verbs. I just talked about what people can do. Now I want to talk about what people want to do. So our next verb is querer, to want. But it's not conjugated, right? We're talking about our first and second person. First person, quiero, I want. You want is quieres. So I've got these two words in my head and I'm just dropping in verbs. Quiero hablar contigo. I want to talk to you. Quieres hablar conmigo? Do you want to talk to me? Quieres ir a la playa? Do you want to go to the beach? And I can use this to tell people what I want them to do. Quiero que te vayas. I want you to go away. I want you to leave. By the way, you have to know the subjunctive to use that last construction I just mentioned. So I talk about what people can do, what they want to do. Now I want to say what they have to do. Now some people like to use necesitar, like they need to. I don't like that one. I like tener que, and then you drop in your verb. So just think of this as a phrase. Don't try to conjugate the que, you'll get confused. Um, this is great. It means to have to. Another reason I like to use this expression is because in Spanish, tener, the verb to have, is a mega verb and it is used in a lot more expressions than we would use it in English. So if I get in the habit of being able to conjugate, you know, um, tener quickly into at least the first and second person, tengo, I have, tienes, you have, I can say a ton of different things. But with this expression, when I'm saying you have to, again, I'm going to be plugging into after tengo que, infinitive means the unconjugated verb. I have to do something. Tienes que, infinitive, you have to do something. Tienes que lavar el carro. You have to wash the car. Tienes que recoger los medicamentos en la farmacia. You have to pick up the medication at the pharmacy. Tengo que hacerlo? Do I have to do it? Si. Sí. Using those three sentence starters really sped things up for me, but it still wasn't enough. The thing that really allowed me to keep up with conversations in real time was this. I stopped viewing the language as separate words and started viewing it as like a series of sentence fragments or phrases. Not only could I create sentences in real time, I could create more complex sentences than I could ever create before. I'm, I'm going to show you what I mean, but uh, I'm going to have to kind of lead you through it, okay? Here are examples of sentence fragments that I may use to say start a sentence. Sabes que? You know what? I'd be like, Sabes que? It came out quickly because I learned it as a phrase. I didn't go, sabes que? And it was a good way to pause for a moment so I could think what the next thing was coming. Sabes que? Another one. Creo que? 
I believe that, but it's really close to the equivalent in English, I think that. Really good one is, ¿Qué tal si? I have a lesson on that one. And it's a great way to start. It's like, how about, and then whatever you want to do. ¿Qué tal si vamos a la playa? How about we go to the beach? Again, I put the little pause in there just for your benefit. These aren't just limited sentence starters. There's tons of ones you can pop in all through the sentence. You can learn tons of these phrases and then kind of pop them in wherever you want. But these are not the most useful. Um, I would say that the most useful little fragments or phrases are the ones that are going to tell you when you trigger the subjunctive mood. Do you remember when I said that the hardest part of using the subjunctive would be knowing when to use it? Well, I found that the easiest way to learn it is to learn these fragments and say that this fragment is going to trigger the subjunctive every single time. And when I write these out, they tend to look more like a math formula or something to some folks. Es mejor que plus the subjunctive. Es mejor que is like, uh, it's better that we do something. For example, es mejor que vendamos la casa. It's better that we sell the house. Now, it's not vendemos, because that would be the indicative, it's vendamos. Anytime I'm going to use this phrase, I always know it's going to trigger the subjunctive, right? Now, because it's es mejor que, that part's going to come out faster. So in my sentence, that gives me a moment to think how to conjugate that in the subjunctive. If I said something like, um, it's better we go to the beach. That first part comes out quick. Es mejor que vayamos a la playa. Those three words gave me that time to think of vayamos. Now, as you get faster, there may not be much of a gap. But to the person listening, that didn't sound like you were struggling or you weren't fluent in Spanish. That's why these fragments work. Another useful one that triggers a subjunctive is para que plus subjunctive. It's like, it's like the English so, but not in like, so, you're going to the mall. It's more like... I gave him the number so he would call me. Para que me llame. I know that every time I use para que, I'm going to use subjunctive. So I'm always going to use it correctly. I don't have to think part about it. Looking at these phrases like this, it might be difficult to see how this would speed up your Spanish. So let me show you. Um, first of all, resist the temptation to try to translate an entire sentence in your head in Spanish before spitting it out. I used to do that, and that will really, really slow you down. It just takes way too long, and you're never going to reach fluency if that's what you're doing. Instead, throw out your first phrase. Get it moving. It's kind of like the locomotive on a train, okay? We're going to start popping in more phrases as we're speaking. Since our phrases consist of more than one word, it gives you more time to think what the next car on the train would be. All right, let's put some actual sentences together and see how this works, all right? Let's say um, I go out to a crowded club with my wife, and it's... Well, not that I'm a big club guy or anything. It's just an example. Actually, I haven't been to a club in a long time. So we go into the club, it's crowded, and my wife looks at me and asks, ¿Qué tal si nos sentamos ahí? How about we sit over there? ¿Qué tal si is one of our set expressions. So I go ahead and send that out. I send that train out. I'm not thinking I'm going to put the whole sentence together and try to spit it out. ¿Qué tal si? How about? And it gave me a second, or in this case her, just a second to translate that next section. We sit there. Nos sentamos ahí. So that's just a little train, right? It's like only two cars in that train. So let's try to make a longer one, all right? Let's say I don't want to sit there and, um, you know, I think it's better if we sit by the entrance. So I say, sabes que? You know what? Because that's giving me a second to think. Creo que... Es mejor que nos sentemos cerca de la entrada. I think it's better we sit near the entrance. So what I'm doing here is I'm sending out my phrases like my train cars, right? My sabes que was to slow this thing down. I'm kind of, it's a locomotive, even though it's a separate sentence, it's starting this thing. Creo que, I think, again, that's a set phrase in my head, already conjugated. Es mejor que, three words come out fast, but it's giving me a second to think how to translate that next part. Now remember, after es mejor que plus subjunctive, I know this is going to be in the subjunctive. When she says, how about we sit there? She said, nos sentamos. That's indicative. I would say, nos sentemos. But that extra little fraction of a second made it easier. Next train car, cerca de. You tend to learn spatial relationships like near, far, on top of, underneath, in front of, all together. Those are all little set phrases. Those are all little train cars in your box you can pop in any time. And then we just put la entrada on it, right? 
Pretty easy, right? Now there are people who say, you know, you can't really reach fluency unless you're actually thinking in Spanish. You're never translating. Um, that's not true. You know, with this method, you don't have to think in Spanish. You can think in English and do your translations, but these phrases are giving you the time to make a sentence. Let's go back and look what we had. Sabes que? Creo que es mejor que nos sentemos cerca de la entrada. Pretty good train, but let's put some more cars on it. All right? Let's add, um, so Juan will see us when he arrives. What do we got there? That kind of so is what? Para que? We know that para que is going to trigger the subjunctive. Para que Juan nos vea. Vea. Not ve. That's one car. Next one. When he arrives. Hmm. Cuando. When he arrives. Now this one is a little tricky, but not super hard because we you will use it a lot. This is going to trigger the subjunctive. Doesn't always trigger after cuando, but if the other clause is dependent on this clause happening, then that's going to be in the subjunctive. What's the first clause? So Juan sees us when he arrives. So he has to arrive first, right? Before he can see us. So that's going to trigger the subjunctive. Don't worry, the last car on that train, the caboose there was the most difficult part of the entire sentence, but I have a lesson dedicated to that too, so you can learn how to do that quickly. All right, don't worry. I've got lots of stuff on this channel. All right, so let's put it all together. Creo que es mejor que nos sentemos cerca de la entrada para que Juan nos vea cuando llegue. And since I've been mentioning the importance of learning both the indicative and the subjunctive, take a look at that. The words in red are in the plain old present tense known as the indicative mood, and the words in yellow are in the subjunctive. You see how it, you can't really speak Spanish without knowing both of them? This approach of stringing phrases together to create sentences in real time is super useful. Um, I may actually do another video walking you through some different conversations so you can practice this technique, you know, we can kind of walk through like I just did. I don't know, that might be useful. If you think it'd be useful, leave me a comment or something to that effect in the comments section. So, in summary, in less than two years, I was speaking grammatically correct Spanish using these techniques and my translations were standing up to the scrutiny of defense attorneys. That's not bad for a kid who got a D in high school Spanish. In this video, I've just been talking about my, you know, my early journey to get to fluency, probably those first two years of learning Spanish, but I didn't stop speaking Spanish after that. Um, Spanish continued to be an important part of my life uh, throughout my 25-year career at the sheriff's office. During that time, I conducted thousands of work-related translations. I appeared on Spanish language television. I spoke at events in Spanish hosted by the Mexican consulate. Um, I even conducted undercover operations 100% in Spanish. Spanish isn't something that I just used at work. Um, it's also played an important part of my personal life too. Uh, my wife is originally from Colombia and we speak both languages in our home. When I retired from law enforcement in 2015, we sold everything and moved to Mexico. Uh, we lived in Mexico full time for six years and uh, the last, say, two years or so, we've been dividing our time between Mexico and the U.S because my wife's mom needs more assistance and she lives in Florida and doesn't want to live in Mexico. So we got that. But her mom's from Colombia, so still speaking Spanish every day. Well, thanks for watching the video. I hope you found it informative. Um, if you are learning Spanish on your own, you might find the videos on this channel useful. I cover the cognate tricks to turn your English into Spanish. I have several videos on the subjunctive and plenty of videos with Spanish phrases that you can pop together like little train cars. Until next time, hasta luego.